Killer Nurse, the story of Lucy Letby. This is a true story. It is an unseasonably warm day in September 2011 at the University of Chester. The auditorium hall throngs with excitement, packed with proud parents, beaming faces and excited students. It is graduation day here and hundreds of students are eagerly awaiting their turn to collect their certificates. At the side of the stage, a nervous 21-year-old student by the name of Lucy Letby anxiously fiddles with her fingers. She is slight and blonde and has a shy disposition. While her classmates excitedly wait their turn, Letby hates being the centre of attention, preferring to blend in quietly in the corner. Her friends would later come to describe her as awkward and geeky. Finally, it is her turn and she hears her name called over the microphone. She swallows, tries to steady her trembling legs, and walks up onto the stage. She looks out into the audience and sees her parents, her father grinning with pride, her mother tearful. She offers a shy, meek smile as she shakes hands with the university chancellor and collects her certificate. She has graduated with a nursing degree, having spent three years studying hard and carrying out placements as a student nurse at Liverpool Women's University Hospital and the Countess of Chester Hospital. She can't help but feel a swelling of pride as she looks out at the audience, since as long as she can remember, she has always wanted to be a nurse. She has never had any doubt about this and has determinedly pursued a career in medicine, Graduating from university is a special moment for anyone, reflecting years of study, academic prowess and hard work. But graduating with a nursing degree carries something even more significant. It qualifies you to work in one of the most important professions in society, one where people place their utmost trust in you, one where you care for people at their most weak and vulnerable and one where you have the most enormous responsibility imaginable. The power to save lives. Or, in the horrific case of Nurse Lucy Letby, the power to kill. This is the shocking true story of the British serial killer nurse Lucy Letby. Based on court and documentary evidence, this podcast dramatisation examines her shocking crimes and what became one of the biggest criminal trials of the century. Due to the distressing nature of her crimes, listener discretion is advised. I'm Joshua Perry Parker, and this is Killer Nurse, the story of Lucy Letby. Episode 1, Nurse on Duty. It is 2012 at the Countess of Chester Hospital. The hospital has long had a presence in the English city of Chester, having originally operated as an asylum in 1829, before evolving into a hospital with the creation of the NHS in 1945, and finally named as the Countess of Chester Hospital by the Prince and Princesses of Wales, Charles and Diana, in 1984. It is a large, modern hospital, with 625 beds, an accident and emergency department, and a neonatal unit. It is here where we find Nurse Letby. Letby has been working as a registered nurse in the neonatal unit for several months now. Inside the hospital, it is a highly stressed and pressured environment, and staff are often dangerously overworked. The NHS, the British National Health Service, often revered around the world, feels like it is in a perpetual crisis, struggling to cope with an ever-growing and ageing population requiring more and more complex and expensive medical treatments. Letby, however, enjoys her work. It was always her dream to work in the neonatal unit, and she enjoys spending time with the babies and parents in her care. Parents of babies in her care commented that she was fairly reserved, but happily chatted about her life, often sharing her interests with them. Normal, ordinary things. While she has been enjoying her work, She finds it a little, well, mundane. She tells colleagues that her real dream is to work in the neonatal intensive care unit, saying that she finds non-intensive care boring. It is several years later, in 2015, 
that Let Be finally qualifies to work with infants requiring intensive care. These infants, born prematurely and with complex and serious medical needs, are perhaps the hospital's most vulnerable patients. They require 24 hours a day intensive care and the latest in medical technology and treatment. Babies are designated to specific nurses depending on their care level. Nurses are often alone with infants for long periods of time, particularly on the night shifts, which are the shifts that Letby prefers. It is in this same year, in this same hospital, where her crimes began. The following content is distressing, and we will not go into graphic details of her crimes. It is not the intent of this podcast to sensationalise her actions. However, we will describe the events as told in court, and of which she was convicted. It is the 8th of June 2015, at 8pm. A premature but healthy baby boy, Baby A, a twin, is in Nursery 1 on the ward, and Let Be is the nurse on duty, working the night shift. The boy had been handed over to Letby shortly after she started her night shift, with the paediatric registrar having clocked off when Letby was 30 minutes into her shift. Letby is alone with the tiny child, the room quiet and peaceful, except for the gentle hums and quiet reassuring beeps of medical equipment. It is at this moment that Letby decides to commit her first horrific crime. Perhaps she has been waiting for this moment for many years. Or perhaps something evil just came over her. Without emotion, she leans over the innocent baby and carefully, methodically, injects a small amount of air into the veins in his tiny body. The effects are instant. Baby A starts to collapse and Letby stands over the incubator, frozen, watching as the baby rapidly deteriorates. As the machines begin to emit warning noises, staff come rushing to his aid. The doctor on duty and nurses quickly run into the room to assist. They see Letby standing over the tiny child, looking blank. There's little emotion in her face. The staff desperately try to save him, but it is tragically too late. Baby A cannot be saved. Baby A dies on the 8th of June 2015 and becomes Letby's first victim. A brutal murder of an innocent baby. The injected air caused what doctors call an air embolus, which leads to strokes or heart attacks. The staff at the hospital are shocked, devastated and bewildered. Baby A was healthy. He had shown no signs of any problems or deterioration throughout the day. A sudden collapse like this is incredibly rare. Strangely, doctors who tried to resuscitate him also observed an unusual blue and white mottling on his skin, which they had not witnessed before and could not easily identify. The parents of Baby A are called and informed of his passing in a small family room on the ward. It goes without saying that their lives broke at that moment. There is an air of shock and grief in the neonatal unit. The staff offer care and support for Letby, who now appears shaken and saddened by the incident. Letby goes home that night to her ordinary three-bed semi-detached house near the hospital. She sits alone in her bedroom, decorated with fairy lights and teddy bears, and opens her laptop. That night, she searches for Baby A's parents on Facebook. She sits and goes through their photos until she is asleep. No more than 28 hours later, Letby is back on duty. Baby B is in her care. She is the twin sister of Baby A. The baby's parents are in the room with Letby. They are devastated and exhausted, still numb from their loss. The parents have been with Baby B all day, terrified to leave her after losing her brother yesterday. However, Baby B was doing well and had been stable throughout the day. Let B puts down her clipboard and approaches the parents. She persuades them to go and get some rest. Their child is doing fine, she assures them. And they can trust her to take care of him as if he were her own. Trust me, she says. I'm a nurse. 
After much deliberation, the exhausted parents finally agree, thank Letby, and leave the room to get some much needed rest. Letby watches as the parents go. Within moments, she approaches baby B and carefully injects air into her body. Baby B instantly collapses, and again, alarms ringing, staff come running to support. The doctor on duty immediately starts resuscitation of the tiny baby, and Let B watches on, a worried and confused expression painted on her face. This time, the parents are afforded a miracle, and baby B is successfully resuscitated and quickly stabilises. The staff at the Countess Chester Hospital neonatal unit are relieved, but bewildered, by this chain of events. What is happening? What caused two healthy babies to collapse? It is a few days later. Let B is back on duty in the intensive care unit, having sent texts to her colleagues requesting that she was given more shifts on the intensive care units in order to build her confidence. Baby C, a premature baby boy, is under the care of another nurse. Let B is unfocused, she's distracted. She keeps paying attention and coming over to baby C, even though he is not under her care. Something keeps pulling her over to him. Her shift leader notices this and tells Letby to focus on her designated babies. Letby and another nurse are both caring for their designated babies, the medical equipment gently humming and beeping. After some time, the other nurse on duty leaves the room, perhaps to attend to another errand, or perhaps just to use the bathroom. It is at this moment that, as soon as she is alone, Let B seizes her opportunity and repeats her deadly pattern. Again, the medical alarms start to ring as baby C crashes. The other nurse on duty charges in, shocked. She had only been gone a few minutes. She sees Let B standing over baby C. The doctor runs in and attempts to revive his tiny body. How is this happening? Three seemingly healthy babies have collapsed in a matter of days. The staff are shaken, worried and completely bewildered. Baby C's family are called to stay in the family room while the staff desperately try to stabilise their newborn. The shift leader, exhausted and tired, looks over and sees Letby hanging around the family room, trying to talk with the parents as their baby breathes his final breaths. The shift leader will testify later in court that she had to tell Letby several times to leave the family alone and focus on her tasks. Letby, however, seems obsessed with baby C and his parents. His parents later recalled that a nurse they believed to be Letby even brought a ventilator basket into them and said, even though their child was not dead, You've said your goodbyes. Do you want me to put him in here? Time passes. The neonatal unit in shock. It is some days later, on the 22nd of June 2015, and baby D has inexplicably collapsed several times. Letby is the nurse on duty. Letby has attempted to murder the baby twice already by injecting air into her body. It is on her third attempt that she succeeds, and baby D dies later that day. Let B spends much of the day hovering around the parents, staying close to them, eavesdropping, and talking to them when she can. The staff are horrified. Another unexpected collapse and death. Something is going horrifically wrong at the Countess of Chester Hospital. Four weeks pass, and mercifully, there have been no more losses or collapses of babies. The staff begin to relax, and pray that whatever was causing the babies to collapse has passed. A freak incident, perhaps, medical anomalies and terrible coincidences. Their relief, however, is short-lived. It is 9pm on the 3rd of August, and the sun is setting on a sunny summer's day. A mother has come to the neonatal unit to give her baby, baby E, her express breast milk. She is tired, 
emotional, but baby E is doing well. It is at this point, walking in the corridor, that the mother hears a high-pitched, shrill scream coming from the intensive care unit. Even though her baby is just days old, she can recognise his scream. She charges into the intensive care unit and over to her baby's incubator. She is horrified by what she sees. Baby E is in extreme distress and there is what appears to be blood around his mouth. Letby is standing over the cot, barely responding or reacting to the scene in front of her. The panicked mother cries and shouts for help. Letby robotically starts to respond. The mother says later she was looking like she was busy, but not really doing anything. Letby touches the mother on her shoulder and coolly says that the bleeding had merely been from a rubbing feeding tube. She asks her to calm down. Baby E died in the early hours of the 4th of August, having lost about a quarter of his blood. A day later, one of Letby's colleagues picks up her phone, scrolls down to Letby's name and sends her a text. She's shocked at the news of another death in the unit. She texts Letby and asks her if she was on duty at the time of his death. News travels fast. Who told you? Yeah, I had them both. Was horrible. Her colleague responds, I just feel for his parents, but for you too. You've had some really tough times recently. Let be. Not a lot I can do really. He had a massive hemorrhage. Could have happened to any baby. Kiss. Over the coming weeks and months, unusual and horrific occurrences continue to take place at the neonatal unit and more and more babies inexplicably collapse. Some tragically die, or are left with life-changing injuries and disabilities. Postmortems would later reveal insulin injected into some of the babies, and deliberate overfeeding in attempts to kill them. Outside of her horrific crimes, Letby appeared entirely normal. She would go home from work each night to her normal beige house, eat dinner, watch TV and text her friends. During the time of her killing, she even went on a girl's holiday to Ibiza. Late at night, however, when alone, she would often obsessively look up the parents of the baby she killed and attempted to murder on social media. She even sends a sympathy card to the parents of one of the babies she kills. She writes, There are no words to make this time any easier. It was a real privilege to care for your child and to get to know you as a family. A family who always put their baby first and did everything possible for her. She will always be part of your lives and we will never forget her. Thinking of you today and always, sorry I cannot be there to say goodbye. Lots of love, Lucy. As she continues her shifts in the intensive care unit, there are further collapses and deaths. And it is in June 2016, after less than a year of working in the neonatal unit, Letby is finally moved to an administrative role within the hospital, away from directly dealing with patients. When she is removed from the shifts, the collapses stop immediately. Her reign of murder and terror is over. But the life she has taken will never come back. Innocent babies, with their full lives ahead of them, taken before they even began. The tragedy and hurt she has left behind with her heinous crimes and the lives she has destroyed can never be repaired. During her one year working in the neonatal unit, Letby murders a total of seven infants and attempts to murder six others. Some worry that that number could in fact be much higher and an investigation is now looking at the records of over 4,000 babies who have been in Letby's care. But these tragic seven killings and six attempted murders are the cases that were proved in court and on which she was convicted. In our next episode, we will examine how staff working alongside Letby became increasingly concerned, why it took so long for the alarm to be raised and for her to be suspended, 
what Letby did when the suspicions began to emerge, and how she was finally reported to the police and arrested for these horrific crimes. That's in our next episode. Kill a nurse. It couldn't be Lucy. Thank you for listening. This podcast was written, produced, edited and presented by me, Joshua Perry Parker. While the podcast is based on true events, some names and locations have been changed to protect the privacy of those involved, and some scenes have been created for dramatic purposes. If you found this podcast interesting, please do rate, subscribe and recommend it to your friends. 